the uh, seminar today for, uh, for uh, the mechanical engineering students and all of our distinguished guests. I appreciate you showing up. Uh, we do have a, um, a, a little sign-up sheet, so make sure that you get your name on here, and if you haven't already, put your affiliation down there. Probably already got it. All right, so today we have a very special guest all the way from California. Um, brought out all the snow and what, uh, ice with him, I guess. I'm not sure about that. Um, so we have uh, Matthew Ismaili uh, here today, Dr. Matthew Ismaili. And um, he, uh, he got his uh, PhD from Nanyang Technolo Technological University. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, okay. Nanyang. All right. uh, NTU is yeah. what's uh, more, more uh, well known. Uh, Nomenclature, but uh, so he's um, uh, coming out of there with a PhD and um, you know, experience in human robotics. At that point, um, went on to um, do some work internationally with uh, Imperial College of London in in the UK, and I'm probably not going to say this correctly. The Institute des Systèmes Intelligence et de Robotique. Or is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, in France. Um, and so he's also done a lot of work with us, uh, setting up various startups along the way. And he's uh, joined as a techno technology manager in a highly uh, reputed, re reputed uh, Rehabilitation Research Institute of Singapore, uh, which is also affiliated with the NTU as well. And more recently, he is a uh, co-founder of Arctic Cares, yep. uh, a company that offers uh, tech-based rehabilitation solutions. And so he's. Um, He's uh, here to talk to us about the idea of using the uh, robot, not all robots are terminators, uh, robotics and rehabilitation and that sort of thing and how, how they can come together. So the field of uh, how we can use these tech devices uh, in the, the biomedical field. So uh, very happy to have him. And uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Ismaili. Thank you, Don, for the introduction. And thank you, Don, for inviting me here. So, and thank you everybody for attending this talk. So, as Don mentioned, uh, we are going to talk about robots today. What I'm going to share is my actual experience that I've been gaining through my education and later on for during my work experience in Imperial College London, Sorbonne in France, and in the hospitals that I've been working over there. So, basically, recently you have seen lots of robotic characters in the movies and in the, let's say, even industry, and uh, you will see lots of the story behind it. Some of them, they are talking that robots could be killers, some robots could save us later <laughs> on, and you will see different form of robots in terms of, that, let's say, humanoid robots or exoskeleton ones. And in some movies, you see that they are out of smarting us and they might be a threat for us in the future. But what is the reality? So if you look at the reality, you would see that robots have been used in different domains for us. For example, in the healthcare, they could be used for surgery, like the Vinci robot that is being used by the assembly. They could be used as pets that would help patients that, for example, when they have dementia to survive and to, to gain their memory better. Or they could be used for rehabilitation, but I would be addressing today for them. But uh, I knew that I'm going to talk to engineers today. As an engineer, I always had this question for myself that, uh, you know, when you are studying and when you are studying basic stuff over there, you would always ask yourself, is this going to be useful for myself? Am I going to use this stuff later on to tackle an issue or can I really be useful for my society? What I would show you here is a big problem for the societies and then I would show you how engineering would go and would be in place to help the human beings to tackle the issues that are over there. So, one of the issues that we see nowadays with the stroke, actually I guess most of you guys are familiar with the stroke. So a stroke is a sudden death of the brain cells that would happen by the blockage of blood or the rupture of an uh, artery to the brain. So when it happens, that some part of the brain would die and eventually uh, the, the patient would lose the sensory or motor control. They either would lose the sense, like they cannot feel anything, or they can uh, lose the, the motor control, like they cannot move their arm or the part that is affected. So unfortunately, every year, 15 million people would be affected by a stroke. The numbers are quite huge. And when uh, it happens, about half of these people would survive and they would need 
uh, rehabilitation to recover to go back to the normal life. Actually, when you talk to them, uh, one of the most desires that they have is to be independent again, to do a simple task that you do, like drinking by themselves. And this is why they would go to clinics, to the doctors, to receive rehabilitation, to survive, and to be able to, again, do what they were been doing before, uh, before being affected by a stroke. And rehabilitation that we are talking about is a highly interactive session that normally is a one by one, one to one session that is between the therapist and the patient. But uh, I want to take you through the, the process flow that happens uh, actually normally in all the countries. So when a stroke happens, as I told you, normally about 43 percent survive, and unfortunately the mortality rate is quite high. This is uh, actually a worldwide number that I'm presenting here, but for developed countries, it's way less than this. For example, for Singapore, it's about 10 to 15 percent the mortality rate. But generally speaking, a big number would die. But for the uh, actually people that survive, about 6.5 million people would go directly to the doctors. This is the golden days that they would spend in hospital. Seven days to two weeks they would be in hospital depending on the country. This is really costly for governments. And this is really uh, actually critical for the patients because this is the time that they would be practiced, they would be observed over there, and uh, they would eventually learn again to do the tasks that they've been doing uh, before the stroke. So they would spend about, let's say, two weeks over there and after that, about 25% of the patients would go to the clinics. Most of these people will need further rehabilitation, but the dropout is too much. Actually, about 75% of people would just go home after this dropout. And the number is really shocking here. Looking at countries like Australia, 80% of these people would go home without having any plan. And this is not good. This is the time that they should practice to, to be healthy again. But let's go back here. From these 25% of the patients that would go to clinics, they would go within some programs that, again, depending on the country, up to three months of the rehabilitation. Since there, there, there are lots of limitations that I would point out later on, they most likely could go to the state actually three times a week over there, and they would receive their rehabilitation <coughs> over there. And after that, they would, again, the dropout is a quite a lot. There are lots of factors involved. Money is one of them is quite expensive for them. Or uh, since they are disabled, they need to have a sibling or a family member to take them to their clinic. So it's really difficult for the family also to take care of these people. And when they are discharged to go home, again, this is the part that the saddest part of the story happens. Most of the time, they would left alone, uh, alone over here. Nobody is there to take care of them. If they want to recruit a doctor, it is super expensive. In Singapore, it's about $300 per hour. In the US, be that different, actually. But it is really costly, and that's why most of them would be actually would, uh, left alone, alone over there, and nobody is really to take care of them. If we look at the actual statistics, we would see that the direct cost of rehabilitation is quite high. It's about $8.4 uh, $8 billion for the And this is what happens in the cost, the rest of the world, and, and you see how it goes. So, and the rate of is really high, the growth rate, because of obvious reasons. First of all, the societies are aging quite fast. Like in Asia, by the year of 2030, 25% of people would be aging more than 65 years old. It, and it's really not a good story. So, uh, and it means that uh, there would be no more number of strokes. But aging is not the only issue. You know, the lifestyle has been changed. People are not practicing that much. They are taking lots of fast food and this kind of thing. We had patients that they were even 25 years old and they had a stroke. And actually, a stress is the other cause that, you know, they would end up having a stroke. And it's sad. So, uh, but what are the current, uh, uh, let's say, ch uh, challenges that we would face in the process that is being practiced in the hospital? First of all, as I told you, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, practice. So uh, obviously there is a shortage of manpower. That's why when they are in the hospital, in the first two weeks, they just receive one hour of therapy per day. And if the more they practice, the better they would get. In Singapore, for example, uh, one of the ministers uh, actually had a stroke over there, and since he was a minister, he could bring a therapist at home. 
And after a month, he would just walk and talk just normally because he could practice uh, actually really hard. But since we have this shortage, people cannot actually have this privilege. Besides that, as I told you, when they go to clinics, the problem is really more obvious over there. Actually, there is uh, not enough uh, clinician over there to help them. And besides that, as I told you, uh, it is really costly for them. So basically, they just escape it. They just go home. And this is the sad side of the story, that they, they could recover, but they just live their lives with uh, disability. But uh, what is the solution that we can think of? One solution is, okay, we can recruit more, uh, let's say, uh, trophies. That uh, is not the best solution. If they could recruit, they wouldn't see these problems nowadays. The other one that goes to engineering side is that can we make some uh, smart machines that can help us to deliver the service that we need to have over there? And the answer is what we are going to discuss today. I would uh, talk about two robots here that I directly work on those, and I will show you how these robots can solve the problem. And since we are in engineering school, I will show you how you can design a device that could be acceptable for the clinicians and for the other people that are going to use it. Because one, once we are designing a device, we are just taking care of the engineering side of the problem. But we should be always aware of this fact that whatever solution that you are providing should be really working in the real life. And we, uh, I show you how we can think about that one. So the first robot that I show you is called H-Man. It's a panel robot, a tabletop, and uh, we, we uh, wanted to make it really lightweight so that it's portable and people can take it home or they can take it to different centers to practice. We have an adaptive hybrid for, uh, control that I will explain more about it. And uh, it is like a, it has a joystick over here that the patient can uh, hold it and there would be a game in the monitor and the patient would play, play the game. So this is for rehabilitation of upper limb for the uh, shoulder and elbow. I will explain how it would work. So first of all, when the patient is walking, the robot has sensors inside it. So constantly it's monitoring and capturing the movement of the patient. Beside that, it would seem like a trap. So, when the patient is walking, you are recording the movements. And uh, the robot is constantly considering how well or how bad the patient is walking. And then, based on the, 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 the movement of the patient, uh, it comes the control algorithms that we, we are using over there, that we call it adaptive control. So, based on the level of disability of the patient, the robot would decide how much help the patient needs to receive. If it's really visible, the robot would help him more and more. But if the better the patient gets, the robot would reduce the level of assistance. And it is really important. Because if you just constantly help the patient, the patient won't uh, put any effort in the movements. And basically, they won't learn anything. You will need to make it interactive and challenging for the patient. Otherwise, they won't learn anything. It is just like when you go to the gym. And if you don't put any effort, you won't gain anything. So this is very really important. And besides that, we provide uh, the feedbacks that I will tell you that it's important. But, but uh, as I told you, uh, this part was the kind of engineering side of it. But when you design a device that needs to, to go to the, uh, the clinicians, you need to provide evidences that shows your claims are true and it works. To do that, we have spent about $2 million to run our clinical trials, one of the biggest ones in the world that is registered actually here. You can see more details about it. So we recruited about 56 stroke patients. All of them are in the, uh, actually the phase that they are in the clinic side of it. But why we pick these people? Because normally there is not much hope for them to recover. We want to show if it uh, really works for them or not. The, the main purpose of this clinical study was to show that this solution that we are offering is as good as the clinical trophy that is being practiced in the hospitals. So we recruited th these patients and we divided them into two groups. One of them is the conventional trophy that they go to a trophy and they would have one and a half an hour of the, the trophy session. And the other group would go for the robotic trophy. It, it would happen three times a week and up to week six, and then we would have follow-ups on them. So as I mentioned here, uh, uh, this is how they would receive the trophy. 
And besides that, we would have assessments. First, when we recruit the patient, we would assess them to see how much is the level of disability. And then we would do the assessment again in the middle of the, the training or the practicing. And then uh, after the practice, and we would have follow-ups. So we want to trace the patients to see how is the uh, improvement. And how it's being done is done by a, clin uh, a clinician. So the clinician is blindfolded to all to both the groups. He doesn't know if the patient comes from the first group or second, because we want him to avoid any bias, anything over there. So they started from point zero, and they use the bugle layer score that is one of the famous one in the field. So it's basically they ask the patient to move the arm, and they give them the score based on the degree that they can move it. And as I mentioned, it's done by a clinician to be quite fair. So they did it in the first week, in the, let's say, uh, week zero that they wanted to start. Week three is uh, in the middle of the sessions. And as you see, the conventional therapy didn't show that much of improvement. This is the, uh, actually the average value that is not that much different from zero. But the group that went through the robotic therapy, you see that they had a really good improvement. And if you compare it with the other group, you would see that this improvement is as good as the other group at, at the end of the sessions that they had. That was a really good story. Actually, it wasn't the purpose of our study. We just wanted to show that we are as good as the other group that we are doing. And it actually scared us, because when you are going to make this big claim, you need to have enough evidence behind that to show why you are this good. Again, what was important is that, oh, sorry. Uh, so, you know that during that time, what happens is that for this kind of people, normally they lose the ability. That if you don't practice and if you don't teach them well, after a while they would lose whatever they have learned. So that's why we do this follow-up, uh, let's say, assessment to see what happens after going through these sessions. Again, we saw that, okay, the, the robotic trophy uh, actually is there. They maintain that whatever they have learned. And uh, this was really actually interesting to us show that okay, people that are using our robot are being really good, even better than the people that they go under conventional therapy. But why? Why it is happening like that? So the first one goes to, we call it in uh, intensive therapy. So within one session, if it is early morning, if the therapist is not tired and it is energetic, he can apply 40 to 50 repetition for each patient. because. You literally need to take the arm, move it up and down, and help the patient to do the movement. And it, uh, but when you are using the robot, this goes easily to 300 to 400 of movement. But again, I need to mention that only the repetition is not important. We call it the smart repetition is important. You need to make the patient to make the move. If you just keep the patient moving here and there, when you leave the patient, he will just forget what he has done. That's, that's what we were doing in the, where, with this robot. So they put their port over there and they were doing this movement. The other uh, actually good effect of this uh, essay trophy is that we could actually decrease the workload of the trophies by 65 percent. As I, uh, actually I forget to mention in the previous slide, each session that we had was one, one hour and a half. For the conventional, all the session was with the trophies. With the robotic trophy, one hour was with the robot, 30 minutes with the trophies. It means that when you have one robot, the, the trophies can divide his time. So he can just uh, put the patient to be practicing with the robot and go to address the other patient. And it is really good for hospital and also for the patient. They can admit more patients in the hospital. And the other, uh, actually, good benefit of this robotic solution is the continuous assessment that you would have over there. If you go to the uh, clinics, you would see all the Fugel Mayor or the other assessments that they have is quite uh, actually raw and quite, I would say, like digital. It's not a good way. It's just like they would ask you to move your arm and one clinician would give you another score, the other one might have another score for you. And they just do it in a number, a limited number of times, like a uh, few times per week. But for this kind of application, you are constantly recording the the performance of the patient. So this is quite important. Because uh, if you remember, I showed you the workflow or the process when you go through a rehabilitation journey. You know, when the patient is uh, in the clinic or when they go home, you can send this robot with the patient to home. 
So what we uh, developed over there, we put all the game and the algorithms on the cloud. So when they go home, the, they don't need to go back to the clinic again. They just, uh, they are over there. The clinician would send the, the practice, actually. So they would practice, and then again, all the scores would send back to the, uh, to the clinic. So they would know that they can uh, monitor the patient. They would know how is the progress. And if they need to change anything, they would just do that. So instead of having three journeys at least a week to the clinic, they can do it in a once a month. That is really important. And it would increase the, actually this was the last study that we were doing lately to show if you have this technology available at home, how it would affect the improvement of the patient, basically. Actually, this study is quite new, and uh, there are not much study to show what is the outcome of this kind of plan. So uh, this is a kind of rough overview of the development of this device. From the, uh, the basic idea that we need to have a robot that should be lightweight, shouldn't feel heavy at the end of the picture, all the way to the first prototype that you would have in a lab and you would use it to uh, actually to have uh, healthy subjects to practice with the robot, then making the robot that can go to the hospital under a controlled environment to be actually this is a real patient that was using this robot and then how you can actually make a bridge to convert this lab prototype to a product that can go really to the market. This is really important and this is actually what we have done over there. I was talking to John and we were talking about this that most of the time actually people would stop here. Because you're right, because when the funding is done, they would feel, okay, we are done, we have the publication, everything, this is a cool idea, but that's it. But what is important is that you need to have this bridge. If it's really working, why we shouldn't make it to go to the market and the patients to have access to this? Actually, this is what we did in our peers and uh, we, we made the commercial uh, for the tablet. But now I want to talk more about uh, some details, how you are going to develop these kind of robots. Uh, I, the, the approach that I would show you here is uh, from, let's say, first how uh, to study the human being's movement. Because these solutions that we are talking here would end up to be a robot that would closely work with the human being. So first of all, you need to know the patterns, the natural movement of human beings. Then you need to be able to quantify them. And then out of that, you can go finally to a solution that would uh, comfortably work with the human beings. I will show you why this is really important. So I would uh, address a really, uh, let's say, simple uh, example over here. I would first talk about kinematic redundancy. When you are working with human beings, most of the time you would have redundancy. And I simply would say, for example, if you look at the wrist, we have three degrees of freedom in the wrist. This one is called flexion extension, radial ulnar, and pronation supination. So you have three degrees of freedom here. If you want to have a 2D test, for example, pointing from one point to the other point, you would have one extra degree of freedom, and this is called redundancy. When you have redundancy, you have unlimited ways to accomplish the task. So when you have redundancy in your wrist, how your brain is deciding what is the best path to go? This is important to know. I will show you why. Here I represent the wrist, for example, as a dice. And I show you why it's important to know how a wrist is doing that. So imagine I want to point from uh, point A to point B. One possible way is just to rotate, let me see, yeah. It's just to rotate about the vertical axis. So simply, if you look at my wrist, it's just like move like this. It's the shortest way to go, the easiest way, and the quickest way to go from A to B. The other one is this. So this is again another way to do this. Instead of doing this, I would do this. And as you see, the configuration is different. So I would end up like this or like this. So it means I have incorporated more degree of freedom. But which one is the best way to go? So to answer this, you need to So as I mentioned, there are infinite ways to do this. Since we are looking for a quantitative quantitative way, we show the, ro the rotations, there are lots of ways to do that. We show with the rotation vectors that has a direction that shows how the direction of rotation and the length is the amount of the rotation that you have done. I don't go to the detail that much, I just show you how it's done. So in 19th century, by 
the history, Dante was the first guy that understood for, uh, for the, uh, this kind of redundant as he was standing actually on the bike. So he understood that for uh, a given aesthetic gaze direction, there is always one way of doing that. Like if the eye wants to look at one point or the other point, the eye always takes one way out of the infinite way that you have over there. So what we wanted to do for, for example, risk that is similar to I in terms of redundancy, we wanted to first study and to understand that if the Andrews law applies for this or not. So we designed a simple game. We have a, a central target over here and eight peripheral targets that would turn on and off randomly. So we asked the patient to be seated, we extract the forearm to make sure that they only can move their wrist, and then they, we give them a, an IMU, that is a sensor that could record their rotation actually. And then we ask them, so the program is like they would uh, randomly turn on and off this, and then they would be just pointing like this on the random targets that we turn on and off. And then we would record the orientation. Out of that, we would record the rotation vectors that I explained in the previous slide. The rotation vectors are the two dots that are over here. So physically, they can locate in, uh, let's say, everywhere in the space. But what we understood is that, and we wish, is to be able to fit a plane in within this uh, cloud of dots that we have over there. The reason is that I want to have a, uh, a way to be able to study the human being mo movement and also be able to compare the movement between humans, I will tell you why. So out of, uh, going back, I have the experiment. I asked them to do the experiment. I'm recording the experiment. And then I'm trying to find ways to, to look at the numbers and to compare them in a more easier way and more meaningful way. So uh, out of the, the points that I had over there, I fit a surface over there that I call it under the surface. And then I study the goodness of fit to make sure that the surface that is representing the movement is a good fit. These are just some uh, simple mathematical, uh, let's say, equations that help me to represent then the surface with two numbers. That is the mean and Gauss curvatures to represent each surface with two numbers. And finally, the shape index that uh, simply, if you look, for example, at two spheres with different red eye, they, they have the same shape. So they would have the same shape number, your shape index number. Simply, if I look at the number and it's the same, I would know that these two person are doing the same. So this is the way that we quantify the, uh, let's say, the self constraint when they are doing a, a pointing test. Then we ask different um, subjects to do the experiment that I showed you over there. I just represent four of them here. We ask them to repeat this uh, experiment for 15 times. And then these are the dundle surfaces that I put together over here. There are some in interesting facts that we would understand here. First of all, they are subject specific. It means that I'm pointing uh, differently than the other person. There, there are, let's say, personalized manners in pointing uh, from one point to the other point. That is important. It means that we might do some work differently, but in our own personal manner. And uh, this is what we also uh, statistically could show over here. So if you would see inter-subject uh, differences for doing a simple pointing test. So next step that we did was like comparing these three movement experiments that we had over there. I just superimposed four movements to just uh, avoid complexity over here. And the other one, we used one of the famous robots in the market. This is called MIT Manus, one of the pioneer robotic solutions that came to market in about 20 years ago. So they took the, they were the pioneers, so they took the robots from industry and they brought it to, let's say, the medical field. So the, the robot looks kind of bulky and then it is meant for uh, rehabilitation of alternative again. So we asked the patient to, or the subject to do the same experiment, but using this robot. What is the outcome? You would see that, first of all, for each, each uh, subject, you, you don't see any difference. You see here, you see we have some variations, but here all of them are gone. Secondly, they all look the same. It means when they are working with the robot, the natural behavior that they have, they have this turtle and it's now different. They are all doing the same. It's not a good thing. It means that something is wrong over here. So the next step was to understand what is wrong here. 
So if you look closely to the robot, you will see that there are lots of motors and actually it's also there, especially for the pronation and supination. So they, uh, they have actuators because they want to move the wrist. For removing this one, you have to move all the mechanism. And it would look heavy for the brain. So when you have one extra degree of freedom, brain just would forget about the heavy one. It would just incorporate the other two and yeah, the tax would, would be done. This is not good, why? Because imagine you have a stroke patient and you want to rehabilitate the upper limb. You want to rehabilitate the pronation supination. When he is going to practice with this robot, the brain would find this degree of rhythm heavy, so he won't use it. So it means it doesn't matter how many sessions you are going to use this robot. He just won't gain the ability to move his arm again. That's why you really need to care about the neuron uh, constraint, we call it rather than only considering the mechanical side of it. So uh, to uh, tackle this issue, we were like, okay, what we can do, we can put a force sensor between the handle and the rest of the robot. So it means that when the patient wants to uh, move the robot, the, the force sensor would first feel the actual intention of movement. So if he wants to move one way, the robot would feel it and then would assist so he won't feel that heaviness of the robot that he was feeling. What is the outcome? You would see that it's helping actually. You would see again some variation comes to place and there would be some differences between the two patients. But it cannot help that much. You know there is a gain over here. If you help the patient too much, again it would be troublesome. It's just like walking on, right, on ice. It's really difficult then to maintain your balance together. <coughs> So this gives us this idea that when you are designing robots, from the very first step, you need to know what are the challenges. So from the design, you would be able to actually think of solutions to avoid this kind of issue. The other issue that um, actually I didn't have uh, uh, time to put all the information here, but I would mention is that you know each robot would have its own hinges and uh, rotation axis. What is important is to align this rotation axis with the rotation axis of human beings. If you don't align them together, again, you would uh, make some uh, extra forces in the joints of human beings. So eventually they would feel pain or they would uh, actually feel fatigue after a while. It means after, and these sessions are quite long, 30 minutes to one, one and a half actually. And if they are practicing this line after a while, they would feel really pain in their knee. So it's really important to account for this kind of issue. So to do that, actually, the, we developed a protocol to first just use this, for example, polymer sensor. And out of some movement, we would come up with the, actually the uh, location of the rotation axis for each human being. Because uh, we are different. We have different uh, morphology, and the, the rotation axis could be placed differently. And after that, this is actually one of the approaches that we took. And then you can transfer this kind of, uh, let's say, the dimensions that you have in a software like Solitude or any other uh, CAD software. And uh, you can model the hand so you know where are the rotation axis for the, the subject that you are designing the robot for. Me. And after that, the risk is actually simple. You, since you are uh, an engineer, you know that you need to put the pivot points and then uh, to actually design the rest of the rest of the linkages that you, you need to have. Sorry, are you having each patient do this uh, sort of experiment? So, yeah, first we had this idea for, yeah, good question, <coughs> to do this. And uh, I, I will tell you what is the problem for this solution. Mm -hmm. So, uh, eventually you would come with a handle that is subject specific. So for each patient, you would have a handle that would exactly align with the rotation axis for that patient. But uh, the, going back to your question, it might be really difficult to do it all way for each patient. The other issue that would come up and be started in the experiments is that after starting the movement, again, the uh, misalignment would happen between this. Right. Yeah, so what we did, we uh, actually I reported this in my book, we, we did this uh, hyperspecity study that it means uh, by some calculations, you know uh, what uh, extra degrees of freedom you can consider for your system to give uh, this freedom to the system to move, to avoid extra interaction forces and flows to happen for the patient. So if it's misaligned, it can move and align again the rotation axis to the human being.
So anyway, we came up with this, and we after that, what we did, we tried to avoid the bulky and let's say heavy load that we had on foundation. So foundation. So one solution is to use cables. So you can put the motors far away, and by the cables, you can transfer the power that you need to have on the system. So we came with this. Uh, uh, differential mechanism that by motors you can drive this and uh, like that you could reduce the perceived inertia on the end of the motor. Eventually when you are designing a system you need to know how the system works and you, know, you need to know the system. So we did the characterization to, to, to uh, characterize the actuator, the gravity on the system, the static and viscous friction and also inertia and then you put uh, within a simple control book, you can compensate for all of these terms. So when the patient is using the robot, you can compensate, for example, for gravity. So if you rotate the, ro the robot and you leave it there, it won't go back because the gravity is compensated or they won't feel the friction. But, but why we did that? Because we wanted to run another experiment. This is uh, actually kind of the last part of my speech that I would have here. So we had this free movement. And then we wanted to confirm first with uncompensated movement. So the robot has it is, is it perturbing the movements or not? Because it was the kind of lightest possible robot that we could make. And then we did the gravity compensation and also gravity together with friction compensation. We recruited 12 patients again and we ran the central experiment that I explained to you. So nine out of 12 patients, they didn't have any changes when you had the three against uh, gravity compensated movements. And it was already a good news for us. It means that the robot was so-called transparent. So when they are working with that one, it uh, doesn't change the behavior. And for three of the patients, actually, they didn't show any change between mm, all of these, uh, let's say, conditions. It means uh, the robot wasn't heavy enough for them to change their behavior. So, the other step of the study that we will do later is to understand what is the threshold that you have over there for friction, for example. What is the amount of friction that you can have in your system, but it doesn't change the behavior. The same goes for inertia and the other, uh, actually, yeah. So to understand that one, you would come to the solution. I go back again to the care delivery model that we had. So imagine when you have a this robotic system, it would come to the place from the very first step of the rehabilitation that you have over there. So we've been talking to the hospitals and we did the, clin the clinical study in one of the general hospitals in Singapore. And you know, when you have the, the robot be, uh, presented here, what they really like is that the robot can follow the patient all the way from the first step to the clinic and to home. So first they would be familiar with the robot, and then when they are at home, they would be practicing and all the patients would be sent back to the clinic. So basically, you can take care of uh, the patient like that. So I come to the end of the presentation. I hope you like it and I'm open to your questions. Thank you. We have some time for some questions. <laughs> um, sure. Um, so, when you and I sort of kind of think about it, okay. um, my first question is, uh, when you are trying to decide how uh, the healthy human subject would move from point to point, right? Yeah. What, uh, what is the performance measure that you're using to, uh, uh, to determine that motion? So, since they are healthy, Sure, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me then, then follow it up with another one. Because when I was looking at literature on this issue, many people had contributed on that, and uh, they were saying essentially this human move to uh, minimize the control effort to move from one, one point to one another point, right? So uh, you can kind of look at uh, is that true or is that, is, is, are they actually doing something else? Well, I think it was DLSP from the University of Michigan that did that research. Uh, what yeah. was your take on that? Uh, yeah, sure. First of all, since they are healthy people, you cannot use any clinical measure because clinical measures are for the patient. So it means if you use that one, all of them, they would take the, receive the whole score for the performance that they are doing. So what we did, actually there are different ways that you find it out in the literature, but what we did in Imperial, we, we studied the donor surfaces that we had over there. So we compare each, bit, each person with himself. So first, we ask him to do the test in the natural way, whatever he is doing. And then we 
ask him to do the task with the robot or with the system that we have over there. Okay. That we can compare com uh, directly the you know the outcome with himself. Then you would know how different he is doing that. Right. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For so example, my, well, that was more. In the, uh, I think my question was that is there a common way each one of us does does this motion uh, in a similar manner, right? More minimizing the control effort. Uh, go from one point. Yeah. Actually. We all minimize the control effort, that's okay. true. Because we, we, the, the brain or we like to use less energy to accomplish right. the task, right? But right. we all have our own personal way. This is important. So for example, what uh, in MIT, what they've done is that you, you, you saw that I was showing this kind of, uh, let me see if I can show you here. Sorry. Okay, so for example, this one, uh, this, this experiment is kind of common, so most of the research groups are using this. So in, uh, in MIT, what they have done, they calculated the amount of energy by, cal by calculating the area between the, let's say, curvatures here, here for each, uh, uh, let's say, target. Mm -hmm. So this, this was their approach. But what is common in all of them, you need to study this for person to person. So right, yeah. right, but I mean, if, if whenever you have an additional mass and uh, structure that's attached, then of course the, the path that does the, the, that incurs the least amount of energy. Uh, the path with, by which you incur the least amount of control to move from point to point differs clearly. Uh, when you have a robotic manipulator, it's a better path. Yeah, yeah. You have to change your path. Yeah, so that is important, actually, it brings you to this point that it's important how much should be that mass, yeah. for example. Uh, yeah, coming up to that one, actually. Yeah, sure. Um, so you, you mentioned that you had the design. Yeah. Uh, well, that was, a, well, that was one of the design objectives, actually. Um, I suppose minimal effective inertia at the end of the day, is what you said. Yeah. Uh, now, and you said you used some transmission. Have you ever considered using parallel mechanisms to do that? Because parallel mechanisms also. Yeah, uh, actually, for one of the. Yeah, yeah. So, for one of the devices that we are designing over there, we were using this counterbalancing mechanism. Right. Yeah, to cancel out actually the inertia that you have over there. This is actually what I want to study again because you know the intention of movement is really important. You mm -hmm. are canceling out the inertia, but you yeah. need to know if yet the brain would take it as a kind of hindrance for the movement, or it would be okay for the brain to do that. Right. If you knew the performance, that's why I asked. I asked yeah. the performance. If you knew the performance measure, then you can come up with a predictive control that uh, that would that would essentially predict motion beforehand yeah. and not uh, you know, yeah, for the hinder the motion. Yeah. And so, so another question I have is when you apply this. Uh, gravity compensation and friction compensation. Of course, there are many other questions about kind of friction model using, etc. But how do you guarantee that the system is going to be stable? Because you're adding adding energy to the system when you when you compensate in gravity. So how does the stability prove? This is, this is a common question for real big robot space, but you can get very little very little uh, stability guarantees. But what what would you take on that? So actually what we did, we compensate for the gravity and friction for the system in, so itself. So you know the amount and you just uh, compensate. Right, but there's for always modeling errors because it's a complex system at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, so again, it goes back to the design itself. That's why it's one of the reasons that I like the uh, cable-driven system. Right. Because then there is a, an issue over there, by itself actually you are considering different levels of safety over there. So mm -hmm. if there is any uh, unstability or anything, the, the patient has to just holding the device and is, the motor is just rotating, and nothing go, would go wrong. Right. But for example, for the mechanism that you see in a mighty manner, since they are using the rigid mechanism, if the motors go haywire or unstable, then the patient would be really Right. So when we designed something like this before, we also used, we used this uh, idea called passive velocity field control, which essentially has is a control that keeps the system passive uh, yeah. You have to the relations in the and essentially it assists when needed, but also it can resist 
than, yeah. than people who probably can do that more yeah. well. Yeah. There's something yeah. similar, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, this is what we did for HMAP, for example. Oh, that that, yeah, actually, uh, I didn't share this part. So I shared with you to the point that the patient is getting better and better. Mm -hmm. But imagine a healthy person is going to play the game. So yeah. it's doing really good. So what would happen? The robots would start to resist and to perturb the movement. Right. So when I want to go from this point to this point, it's perturbing me and I need to put really effort to be direct and to go to that point. And this is very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let me open it up. I want to make sure you, guys, <coughs> you, you are meeting with um, yeah. with him also so you guys can. It was a really interesting conversation. Yeah. Okay, let's have a couple more. Uh, I wanted to go back to your technology of writing this slide. And okay. I'm just curious, can you tell us, you know, that's a, it's a very long path to yeah. market introduction as well. And yeah. Maybe you could just give us a sense for the different funding mechanisms that you had during that trajectory, as well as maybe the time frame from yeah. TRL 1 to TRL 9, which is very impressive. Actually, that's a really interesting question because it's really important how you are managing your finances, actually. <laughs> so most part of it was done by research funding because you know, at least in Singapore, it was easier to get that money. And you know, and you yeah, could NSF's going to stop right around three. Uh -huh. We're not going to get oh, much really? past there. Oh, no. yeah. Actually, I came all the way to TR6 or seven. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, so what we did actually all the from here, uh, okay. Timeline-wise, we started in 2013. The, this one actually is still you know, yeah, <laughs> so long ago. Yes, because the, actually what really takes time is the clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. So <coughs> we, we have the robot and first to be to make sure that it's safe, we needed to have a lot of trials at in the lab with the healthy subject. Okay, this is really safe. And then what I need to mention again, we had a lot of sessions of meetings with the clinicians. So we were designing the robot, we were designing the game and the controller, and then we were inviting them over. So they came, they practiced with the robot, and then they were the, the one to tell us, okay, please change this, we don't want to have this game, it is really boring for the patient, they would call it, and they did actually. Mm -hmm. Or this is really not a good movement, you know, you need to care, take care of lots of these kind of points. So it took time. And up to here, actually, we have spent about two million and a bit more, actually, dollars to get to do the clinical trials and everything. Well, that's the impressive part, I think, mean, because yeah. finding, finding how to pick patients is easy. You just get to ask you what's that. So no, no, so, really so actually, yeah. then, yeah. no, so if you look at the logos that I put over there, one of them is TTSH, it's one of the general hospitals over there. So yeah. one of the fundings that we had, I guess I put the abbreviation here, mm -hmm. is called NMRC, National Medical Research Council. I always forget what it is stands for. <laughs> so this is one of the major, uh, let's say, fundings that you can get in Singapore. And this is really important because you need to have a clinical PI as well. So that, and also later on it would make your life easier because we had a doctor from the hospital. So he was taking care of the patients, finding the patients that we needed to have, you know, they need to actually meet some criteria like the Fugamere uh, score and all of those things. So that actually about one million just easily went away for them because you need to pay for each station, you need to pay for the transportation. And you know, in the middle of the way, you need to make sure that they are not going under any other traffic. And they, sometimes they go and the other day they come to you and, you know, I, my cousin brought a doctor to me and I practiced a bit and then you understand, you know, okay, he's out. Because, <laughs> because it, it would affect the performance. Right. You cannot then judge him if, if uh, the performance is good because of your session or he's just doing better because of his own private right. session. Right. So we had lots of actual dropouts because of that and you need to spend money for that mm -hmm. one. So going back to your question, we brought this forward to the, okay, let's okay, go back here, to this level. From this point onward, actually, so the NMRC also helped us to make the first, uh, let's say, commercial robot, that is this one. And from this point, we founded the company, and uh, one of the good mechanisms that we have in Singapore is that the, if the university sees someone, there is a competition, let's say. So, all the groups can go to this competition, you present your project, your, your outcomes, everything. And if they find it interesting, there are two panels, one internal and one external panel. You need to present, and if you are a winner, they would support you for $500,000.
it is what we got actually on it. <laughs> and it's a really good support because it's a convertible loan. It's like after two years they would evaluate your company. You can either give them shares or give the money back to them. So this is really helpful for us and we got that funding that helped us to move toward this one. Because after this, this is again Actually, this part is really important. So whatever you have had up to here to me is like, I, if I want to be really generous, 40% of the work. If I want to be really generous. The rest of the job is really tedious here because you are talking about medical device, right? So you need to go to get certificates depending on the country. If you are going to US, FDA should be there. It's really costly. Again, you know some countries like Australia, they want you to do the clinical trials right over there or China. It means you need to spend money again. Mm -hmm. And entering into each market is about two million dollar cost for you. <laughs> so this part is really important, how you want to go there. So I didn't explain that much for, uh, for here, but if you like, I can share more information. Like for China, what we did, we found an investor over there with this possibility that he would go for CFDA, what they call it over there, because you need to have clinical trials in three different cities, three different hospitals. <laughs> Yeah, a long way to show that, okay, it works on the Chinese population. Wow. And then you would have the certificates to be able to be in the market already. You said from our uh, TRL 109 is five years. Yeah, uh, yes, well, five years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's five years. I'm a generous 30. I think five was too bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, I thought that was pretty fast, but are there other questions that So what, what's your, what's the composition of your team? I'm assuming there's a few of you involved and, and what's your role within that team? That's a really good question because we have different teams in different, let's uh, say, uh, stages. So up to here, since it was in the lab, we had a combination of PhD students. We were based in the School of Mechanical Engineering. But my supervisor, for example, he was a guy by, uh, by a study, he was electrical engineer. And uh, we had some neuroscientists in our team, uh, mechanical engineers, and some also software guys, because we needed to design our games in-house, and some control for sure. So the control and software was done in NTU, the, uh, some part of control was in Imperial College because we were working with the School of uh, Bioengineering and they are really good and it's actually one of the main also co-PIs of the NMRC that we got. And then later for the company is quite a critical question. What is the combination of the team? Because your, the, the $500,000 might, might seem really a good number, but our estimation showed that it would just help us for one year. So it's really important who you are going to recruit and how you are going to, to pay. So we made the core team really, really small. The most critical people that you need to have. For example, one mechanical engineer for sure. So if the founder is mechanical, you don't need to recruit. <laughs> then electrical. For software, for, for first we just outsource and then you need to have a software guy because you need to actually have the software. The software goes to the game design and also since we were working on cloud, you needed to have some people that they are familiar with IoT. And then again, there is some important issue that I need to mention out. You know, you would have your recordings, performance, everything in engineering terms. Like you would have, okay, this is the velocity, this is the torque. But when you show it to the clinician, it would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, they know their own terms. So you need to translate all of this to the, let, let's say, Fugel Mayer's course. So to have this kind of translation, actually, this is again research, and you need to know what is the best way to do that. So what we did actually, a, a good way to maybe for people that they want to have this kind of companies later on, is that we have a really a strong relation with the lab. So our R&D gets uh, states with the lab, and then the development goes to the company. So when you want to bridge from here to here, so everything, in, uh, I don't know how is the regulation yet, but in NTU, all the IT belongs to the university. So since we were the founders and the, the IP was, uh, the patent was under our name, we have the first right to go to licensing. So they, even though we developed this, we licensed it from the university. And it's good for university as well, because 
when you are making money, some part of money goes back to university. And this one that I told you is coming actually from this money. So it brings some money to support the other things. So this is where we translated here, and then we just kept the group as this one as well. And one uh, actually dropped that we recruited over there. Because when you have this robot, you need to take it to hospital. And then the best person to talk to clinician is a doctor. So he was talking to them and showed them okay, how this robot works. Are there any features of this device that you hope to improve? Are there like any other things you hope to modify? Yeah, definitely. So first of all, but the, you know, uh, as you remember, I started from the problem and then I went down to the solution. So we wanted to come with a robot that is portable and safe to go home. So up to now, this is safe to go to the clinic. And since it has motors, we are yet really careful to send it home. And you know, yet uh, there are lots of considerations that you would have from the regulation for this. Like, imagine you put it there and somebody put some coffee on it, or I don't know if there is any uh, way that they can make any harm to themselves. So these are the parts that you really need to improve. So for the robot that we are going to send home, we really want to make it even lighter. Now it's about 8 kg, 8 kilograms, about maybe 16 pounds. Here, yeah. <laughs> And now we want to even make it lighter. And also for home, for the moment, we are removing the motors. But the mo when you are removing the motor, it is really helpful because it helps them to monitor the patients. So the next step is to put the motors back in a safe way that is not uh, endangering the end user over there. Are you developing, are you still developing control uh, part of the robot? Actually, yeah. Actually, this is a, the answer to both questions. So one of the main part of the group are the control, uh, let's say, students. So we had two specific PhD students that directly they were working with the Imperial College as well. And they are working constantly on the control algorithm of this robot. But I need to mention here, you know, this kind of algorithm, by design, we really, really want to make it really simple so that you can make it really lightweight and also cheap. Because you know the MIT madness that I told you is about $150,000. So some general hospital can afford it. This right. one, we made it really cheap. So, and it, making cheap and simple means that the people like Chinese people can easily copy that. How you can avoid that? The control is one of the right. secret sauce that you can put there and they cannot copy it. But constantly should be working. Um, unless there's any less questions, uh, I think we're at the end of our time. So, it's like we're good. All right, so uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you so much.